I want to speak today to you on the very important subject, how to see your prayers answered. All over the world, people are turning to prayer in this time of the global pandemic. Google searches for prayer have surged to their highest level ever recorded. Using daily data of Google searches for prayer across 95 countries, Professor Jeanette Benson, Associate Professor of Economics at the University of Copenhagen, found that the increase in the number of inquirers for coronavirus prayer was a global phenomenon. So often, of course, it is times of great trouble that people discover the power of prayer. Abraham Lincoln, who is the president over a country divided by an absolutely horrific civil war, said, I have been driven many times upon my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. Britain turned to God in big numbers in May 1940, when the king called the whole country, all the government, everybody, to a national day of prayer. The British army was cut off in France and this country was faced with the imminent threat of Nazi invasion. But within days, a third of a million men had been rescued by many boats of different sizes in what was called the Miracle of Dunkirk. After that, the Battle of Britain was won and the invasion was called off. James chapter 5 verse 16 says simply this, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Today, as we face so many challenges in the nations and in our own lives, we do really need to discover or rediscover what it is to really pray. Not just pray prayers or go through a kind of a routine and say, well, we prayed and we know how to pray, but really pray from the heart. So it's not a religious exercise. And one person who really did know how to pray when he was in a mess and his people were in a mess and he knew how to get answers to prayer is the biblical character of Nehemiah. Now, some of you have heard of him and some of you have not. If you have, listen again to some of the lessons that we can learn from this story. Now, Nehemiah was a very high level and trusted official in the vast and powerful Persian Empire. He was what is called cupbearer to the king, meant that he had the responsibility not just for checking out was good wine, but checking out the king wasn't going to be poisoned here and for guarding the royal apartment. And he was also a Jew who was very sad when he learned that the city of Jerusalem was still in ruins well over a century after the Babylonians had destroyed the city in 586 BC. And in 445 BC, when he learned that the walls of Jerusalem were broken down, the gates had been burned by fire, and the Jews didn't have any defenses there, and those who had gone back were, uh, to rebuild the temple were in great trouble and great pressure, it really affected him. And it was at this point when he realized just how desperate and sad things were for his people and the holy city of Jerusalem that he began to pray that Jerusalem would be rebuilt. And we need to pray that many lives will be rebuilt, that our cities will be rebuilt morally and spiritually, that families, indeed whole nations, can be restored where things seem to have just been broken down in so many ways. And an amazing transformation that was to take place began when this one man, Nehemiah really had an encounter with God in prayer. One person who really knows how to pray can have a tremendous impact. Let's learn quickly some simple lessons here. Are you ready? Note these down if you can. First of all, you need to come before God with a broken spirit. Many people have an unbroken spirit. They're full of pride. They know the answers to everything. But Nehemiah chapter one says this, when I heard these things about the state of the city, he said, I sat down and wept. And when the news reached Nehemiah, it wasn't just that the place was broken, but his own heart really was broken. He was overwhelmed by sadness at what had happened to his nation, what had happened to his people. And it was this anguish of spirit that drove him to prayer. <clears throat> he felt crushed. And that really was why we read that he wept. Time and again in the 
history of the Bible and indeed of Christian revivals, we read that or we see that weeping actually precedes a time of reaping of many blessings. And it's important that we experience this too, when we actually weep for ourselves. Do you weep? Have you ever mourned about the areas of your own life or your family that are broken down. God, my heart is not where it should be. My family, wow, so many things I never expected. This is it's more broken than, than I would like to admit, but I have to face it. We're not in a good way. How keenly are you aware of the presence of God and your need for God? One of the great hymns from Wales was this, I need thee, oh, I need thee, Every hour I need thee, O oh, bless me now, my Saviour, I come to thee. Or in the words of another old song, let me ask you this. How long has it been since you talked with the Lord? How long you told him your life's hidden secrets? How long since you prayed? How long since you stayed on your knees till the light shone through? Well, how long has it been for you? I believe that for many Christians, it is a time to come closer to the Lord. It's time to build up those protective walls of prayer, of Bible reading. It's time to get serious about a fresh encounter with God, especially at a time like this and at the start of a new year. It's not enough to know about God. We have to experience the Lord constantly. And we can only know real change in our life when we know that the Lord has really touched us down deep, deep within, and brought healing and hope to us. Also, it's important, not just that we weep about ourselves, but that we weep for others. Jesus, like Nehemiah, wept over Jerusalem. William Booth, the pioneer of the Salvation Army, wept over the sins of London and the pain that he felt for millions of lost souls. A man by the name of David Wilkerson, founder of the great Times Square Church, wept over the derelict spiritual state of New York, and he started a ministry that has rescued many, many thousands of gang leaders, addicts, and criminals. I wonder how much we are touched by what happens around us. It's easy to get into the spirit of things, to have an opinion, maybe to criticize, but how much do we pray and do we mourn? Do we weep even for the state of the people all around us and our nation? Secondly, I want to see this, that we need to set a time to fast and pray. It says in verse four, for some days, for some days, I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. In the Bible, as many of you will know, fasting and prayer are often linked together to show how God's power and God's purpose can be released in a new way and revealed in a new way when people are serious about coming to a new level of spiritual breakthrough. We knew the disciples recognized this when they went to Jesus and they asked why they hadn't been able to cast out a strong evil spirit. And Jesus replied, Mark 9, 29, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer, and as some other manuscripts say, but by prayer and fasting. But for prayer and fasting to be effective, it cannot just be a religious practice. Now, Jesus spoke of a proud Pharisee who boasted, oh, I pray, I fast twice a week, but he didn't have his prayers answered because his heart was not right. And yet the sinner who was standing next to him, who sincerely cried out to God, God be merciful to me, a sinner, God heard his prayer. Now, Joel chapter 2 verse 12 says this, even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping, there you go, weeping again, and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God. Isaiah also attacked the hypocrisy of people who went through very extravagant motions of fasting to show how spiritual were, but actually on the days of their fasting, they were punching people and they were exploiting all their workers. In Isaiah 58 verse six, 
Is not this the fast that I choose to loose the chains of injustice, to untie the cords of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? In other words, prayer and fasting is only effective when we pray with soft and humble and change hearts. Third lesson, let's move on to this. When we pray, if we want to see answers, we need to focus always on the greatness of God and the faithfulness of God. This is what Nehemiah did, verses five to six. Then I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps the covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands, let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. Nehemiah looked beyond the negative news to focus on the greatness of God and his understanding of the righteous character of God. He understood that God is awesome. And when he was praying to this God, he knew he wasn't just saying words. He was coming before the great and awesome God who has the power to change any and every situation. And he knew that the very character of God is that he is a faithful covenant keeping God who always responds to those who love God, to those who obey God and those who pray constantly to him. Nehemiah was clear that he was a servant of God. Even he wasn't like a pastor, if you want. He was in a very secular role in a high and influential position. But he knew I am actually a servant of God where I am. And I'm part of the people of God. And when we also know that we are adopted into the family of God through the blood of Jesus, we can come confidently to a great and awesome God with our requests. And it says in Hebrews 4.16, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And next point, to really pray, there must always be confession of sin. We must confess all sin. To have a relationship with God, to have answers from God, you have to be right with God. You have to be totally transparent. Now, look what Nehemiah prayed here. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. Now, this is very important. Nehemiah wasn't trying to fake anything with God. He wasn't trying to shift the blame to others. He wasn't trying to make excuses and to minimize his sin, to make him look better than he really was. He absolutely 100% put his hands up guilty. He admitted that his people, his nation had sinned. He admitted that his own family had sinned. He said, I have sinned, I include myself. He was totally honest with God. This is this, we have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed your commands, decrees and laws that you gave your servant Moses. How is that? This is real confession. This is real honesty. And if we want to see spiritual breakthrough at any level in our lives, in our families, in the church, and certainly in a nation, we need to be very humble in our confession, very honest, confess resentments, confess where there's bitterness, pride, anger, disobedience, immorality, racism, injustice, so many things, sexual sin. What is it? You need to be honest. God, this is the state of my heart. This is the state of the group I am part of, the people I am part of. It's not pretty, Lord, and confess it. Don't point the finger at others. Confess your own sin. And I have found in my own life, and I have found dealing in ministering to many people, not just in public, but also in private, that the more real we are, the more honest we are, the more open we are and sincere to God, then the more we receive freedom and forgiveness. As 1 John 1 9 says this, if we confess our sin, then he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to purify us from all unrighteousness. Moving quickly along to the next point, we should always pray to see answers to prayer, 
pray in line with God's word. Not just what we think, what does the word of God say? What does it teach? What are the promises of the word of God? This is in verses eight and nine. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if the exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and I will bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. It goes on in 10 and 11. These are your servants and your people who you have redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayers of your servants who delight in revering your name. Nehemiah was aware of the promises that God had made. And he was very clear, if you're going to go away from me, there will be judgment. But if you come back to me, even if you have totally messed it up, even if you've gone so far away from me, but I'm going to hear when you really repent, I'm going to hear and I'm going to restore you. I'm going to bring you back. And this was the basis that he made his great appeal to God to help for the rebuilding. The apostles prayed like this in the New Testament. that They raised their voices together in God to prayer. In other words, we don't just pray quietly, but the whole company of them, they prayed, they really prayed. It's like when I went to um, Korea, to the big church there, to a prayer meeting, 25, 30,000 people. It's like a 747 starting up when they're all praying. My goodness me. And they really raised their voices to God. You spoke by your Holy Spirit through your servant, our Father David. And then they proceeded to quote the promises of God and the word of God from Psalm 2 and 1 to 2. It's so important that we pray, we get the word of God and then we pray, Lord, this is what you've said now, please fulfill this in my life. Please fulfill it in my family. My children may be far away from you. There may be dysfunction, but I believe, Lord, that you will honor your word. You will bring them back. We may not have much money, but I believe, Lord, that you will supply all our needs here. And when we pray with God's word, we can be sure that God will be faithful to keep his promises. Next point. Are you ready for the next point here? Be specific in your prayers. Many times Jesus said, what is it you want me to do to the blind man? I want to see. Now in Nehemiah 1.11, give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. Nehemiah wanted to succeed in a very big project to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. This was what he was focused on. And he asked for specific success on a particular day with a particular person. And that person was the very influential ruler of the Persian Empire. And when the king actually asked him, in Nehemiah 2.4, he asked him this question. The king said, what is it that you want? Nehemiah was very clear. He prayed quickly, but he was very clear in his request. He wanted to be released to go to Jerusalem and to rebuild. He wanted specific items uh, for protection and for provision so they could get on with the job. And we need equally to be very clear what it is we ask God for. What is it we're asking the Lord for? He's the King of Kings. And if you're in a position with a influential earthly person, not necessarily king or possibly you stand before the queen or whoever it is, you need to be clear. If they say, how can I help? Please, this is what I need you to do to help uh, our family or this situation or our church or this nation. Be specific. And finally, are you ready here? Expect to receive answers from God. Nehemiah 2.8 says, and because the gracious hand of my God was upon me, the king granted my request. Through prayer, Nehemiah, despite a lot of opposition, was able to gather a very dedicated team to work with him. And the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down for over a century, were rebuilt in just 52 days. Today, in our time, in our society, we can easily look around and say, that's a ruin, that's broken down. People say it's a post-Christian society, Christianity is a thing of the past. No, it isn't. The greatest revivals, the greatest reformations, they always come 
at times like this when people begin to cry out to God and we can see the greatest revival in the UK and South Africa and other countries we've ever seen. We can help to rebuild so many lives, so many churches and the foundations of our society. Anything can happen. All things are possible with a great God, but it all begins when we really learn how to pray because when we really know how to pray, God for sure will hear and answer prayer. So let's pray right now. I don't know the state that your life is in right now, but however much things are broken down, I want to tell you that God can work a miracle of restoration. He can rebuild your life. Even after a long time of trouble like they had in Jerusalem, God can cause things to come back again. In, he can do miracles in your life. If you want that new beginning, if you say, God, well, I need you to help me because I can't see any other help. Why don't you call on the Lord? Why don't you pray right now? Please bow your heads. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son, your only son, Jesus, into this world to seek and to save what was lost. Lord, I confess that I really need you. I need you to cleanse me from my sins. I need you to free me. I need you to give me hope. I need you to help me rebuild my life. Please, Lord, come to me, heal me. Give me a new start, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen.